Okay. Welcome, folks. Um, welcome to the Discovery Fund webinar. My name is Rosanna Diaz. I'm Inclusion Research Producer at Promising Trouble. Um, we are the partner organization with Power to Change on the Community Tech Programme. Um, firstly, if you have any access requirements, please do let us know um, in the chat box and you can message uh, one of the hosts directly. Um, if you have a question, but you feel you'd be more comfortable to speak to one of us directly, yeah, message us directly, but you can also put stuff in the chat and we encourage you to use the chat um, whilst you're with us today. Um, there are subtitles available for this webinar and the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, you can add your questions in there and that would be super helpful and then everyone can benefit from your question. So over the next 90 minutes, we're gonna tell you a bit about the Discovery Fund, what it aims to do, what it can offer you and also how you can apply and we'll also hear from a couple of community businesses who have already made their own community tech and who are currently being funded to maintain it through our last funding program which was called community tech maker and maintainers so they'll talk a little bit about their journey from um, initial ideas through software development and also how working in the open is central to what they do. So we'll be unpacking that later. Um, we've got a lot to go through today, um, but just to let you know that there will be a comfort break at 2 p.m. and two chances to have your questions answered. So just before the break, um, before 2 p.m., for questions specifically about the programme offer. And then at the end of the session, there'll be a space for questions about eligibility, the application form, and the assessment process itself. Um, so when you are asking questions and typing those into the Q&A box, please do give us your name and your organisation too. And um, that way we'll know who submitted what questions. And if for any reason we don't have time to answer your question during this session, as long as you have left your name and your organisation, we'll be able to email you an answer afterwards. Also, if you do suddenly think of a question after the webinar, you can email it to us at communitytech at powertochange.org.uk. So we are going to get started. And our first speaker is Fergus Arkley, who is Digital Innovation Manager at Power to Change. And Fergus is going to talk us through what the Discovery Fund is. Um, so over to you, Fergus. Thanks, Rosanna. And uh, hello, everyone out there. Um, yeah, so delighted that you're spending the time to uh, yeah to find out more about the Discovery Programme. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, give you an overview of the Discovery Programme, but I think the best place to start really is what is community tech? So I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up. So over the years, we've been seeing lots of examples of where communities are sort of standing up and, uh, to, and making a change in the face of the current tech environment. You know, they're being let down by the sort of corporate offer that's on that's out there. They're not getting value for money. And basically, simply the tools that are being offered a lot of the time don't meet their broad needs or go against their values. So we're seeing this bottom up response where communities are making the decisions to do things differently and take control and develop their own technology. And this is where we get to community tech. So. Um, this is our sort of definition and it's you know this is a broad definition that we've been you we've been working on for a while but uh, so i'll just work talking through it so it's community tech refers to any hardware or software that delivers a benefit to a community group and which that community group has the authority to influence and control so when we talk about influence and control this could be come from like ownership it can come from the fact they've made it themselves it, or it could from come from some other sort of governance uh, relationships so that might be part of um, a collaborative collaboration or through a, a co-op a platform co-op but put, put simply so community tech is technology that's built with by and for communities and that is locally accountable and creates value so community tech can be uh, lots of different things really but it could be software or hardware that's a community or organization that's made itself uh, it could be open source or a community managed software used by lots of different groups. And I think maybe it's worth me at this stage sort of giving you um, some examples of our first funding round. So the first funding round we did was called Makers and Maintainers, which supported the care and repair of existing community tech. 
And some of the examples include sort of the Bristol Cable. So what they did is they developed their own community membership management process, uh, platform. So it's like a membership um, management system. Uh, we've got Stretford Public Hall, and what they did is uh, they have they are a, a co-op and they have community shares, and they created a sort of a community shares uh, register, which means that they can manage their community shares register, and that's then open up to everyone else. You've got Equal Care Co-op, which has created uh, that's like a bubble around the people who are cared for, and like everyone else get involved. And this is the piece of tech that they developed. Uh, and you've got Tamar Grow, which is part of a, a wider sort of co-op, which is connecting up. Um, growers, local growers with local community and bridging that gap and making sure that that local produce is getting there. Um, and of course, we've got Solidaritech and uh, Trinity, you're going to hear about um, shortly. Um, so a bit more about discovery itself. So like I've just said, so building on our previous support for the sector, so with makers and maintainers, uh, we're looking to support um, basically new early stage ideas and new entrants with discovery. So it's that very early stage. So this is an opportunity for communities to explore and test uh, community tech from their unique situation. So it's like a bit of a, like a feasibility. Uh, it's going to provide the space. So when we say space, it's like time, the resources and support to explore a challenge or a nascent idea. And it, we want to bring together a new group of people to explore community tech, whilst also allowing sort of existing uh, community tech users or those who are already in the space to think, uh, have some opportunity to think about some new ideas. And we're trying to do this in a sort of inclusive way. So we're, we're trying to encourage and support applications that are focused on supporting those experiencing marginalization. Um, so what, what is it? So what, what are you going to get? So there's going to be 20 £10,000 grants. So these are, this is offered as flexible funding. So when we talk about flexible funding, we mean that you don't need to tell us exactly how you're going to spend the money at the beginning. So you just say, you know, we, you answer the questions that Rosie will go through in a minute. And then like, then you get the money and then you can spend the money as you see fit through that journey. So it's to help you sort of grow into the project rather than thinking like, you know, having to think of exactly how you're going to do it from the very beginning. Uh, it's over a six month period and it's like an opportunity to do some exploration. Uh, so thinking about feasibility. And then on top of that £10,000, there's an additional £2,000, which helps you to participate in something called a community tech community of practice. So this is what Rosanna is going to talk about in a minute, but it's about basically um, an opportunity to to uh, work with others and um, under, and to get access to peer support and expert uh, input, and also to help you work uh, and in the open. So sharing how you're pro you're progressing. And then finally, we understood that it's a bit hard to sort of just give people the money to say, right, go ahead, here, spend your money, and then develop an idea. We also wanted to help you along that journey. So we're working with Cast, and Dan's going to. Be here and he's going to share a bit more information about the community explore program but it's basically giving you all the tools and the processes to take you through the, the process of uh design, right from sort of defining your idea uh discovery uh, going through the discovery process and then defining your idea and the key here is that uh this is optional so you don't have to do it if you feel as if you're well placed to do that that's fine but you know this is an optional offer which you might choose to take up um so what can the funding be spent on well staff costs so i think a lot of this will be going on covering people's wages so given covering the wages for people to start thinking doing the research and getting that down um it's about paying for your staff time to do the community explorer program you might do user research you might bring people in to do that it could be getting some expert advice in there getting some, some consultants it could be covering your time to share and contribute to the digital commons and again as we said covering your time to engage with the community of practice. So actually make free, helping you to free up time so you can start working with other peers. Um, now I'm handing over to Rosanna now to tell you a bit more about the community practice and some of the work we're doing around how we're supporting marginalized communities. Thank you, Fergus. Um, yeah, we wanted to take uh, just a few minutes to talk through um, our approach to inclusion, our approach to supporting um, communities experiencing marginalisation in the community tech space and also in society more widely. Um, so I'm inclusion research producer at Promising Trouble. Um, we're partnering with Power to Change on this project. And Promising Trouble is a social enterprise working to ensure more people have the opportunity to shape, inform, and create new technologies that work for them. 
We are involved in the movement around community tech and my job over the next four or five months is to support the development of inclusion strategies for the community tech program and also this community of practice that Fergus mentioned, which we are co-stewarding with Power to Change. Um, and the community of practice is really about joining up the existing abundance within the community tech space and supporting collaboration. So it will be an informal network or program that brings together people and businesses from across the community tech sector to connect, to learn, share resources and best practices. Um, there's a lot more information about what it is and what's on offer on our new landing page, which is communitytech.network. Um, and there's links to the mailing list, a recorded talk, um, and the other things that are on offer as we start to kind of build and co-create this space with people who are interested. Um, in terms of inclusion, we're thinking a lot about how we make the invitation and the offer most suitable for those who are currently underrepresented and underserved in the community tech space. Um, and we're also thinking about what is it like to be a part of a community of practice and how do we make it welcoming and accessible and that is to also in terms of inclusion to those who maybe have been doing this work for a very long time and bring with them lots of experience or perhaps have lots of technical expertise and understand the languages that are used in this space but we also want it to be open and welcoming for people who maybe are just curious about what community tech is and what it could do and what it could um what it could offer for their communities um, and the communities, whether they are place based, kind of based around lived experience and interest or a kind of theme discussion or exploration that you're going on together. So that is really at the heart, I suppose, of what we're trying to do in terms of inclusion. My background is in anti-racism, anti-oppression practices and within the creative sector. So I bring in a lot of, um, I guess, my, my lens is around how do we create collective caring spaces and that's something that will be um, embedding within the community of practice as we start to develop it together with people who join. Um, we've got a meetup next week. I'll tell you a bit more about that at the end of this session. But as I said, you can find out way more information about what's on offer, but also around our inclusion approach. There is a blog post on communitytech.network. And I'm gonna hand over to Rosie now to talk about inclusion, specifically in the context of this funding opportunity. Um, so over to you, Rosie. Thanks very much, Rosanna. So, um, yeah, as well as Rosanna's brilliant work on inclusion and the community of practice, um, Power to Change uh, is working hard to embed diversity, equity and inclusion in our approach to funding. The tech world's not known for its diversity, and this is a pa uh, pattern we definitely don't want to replicate in our funding. So we've been thinking about how we can make sure we recognise the value of organisations that are actively working to support marginalised communities. And we also recognise it's often the organisations led by people from those marginalised communities that do the best work in promoting equity and inclusion. So to make sure organisations doing this good work are given credit in the assessment process in discovery, we've added a fifth question to the application form, explicitly asking you to complete the statement, our organisation supports marginalised communities by. This question will be scored in the same way as the first four questions, which all ask about your community tech idea. Um, and we hope that by including that question, it will result in a more diverse cohort of grantees who get funded and that people who do get funded will be committed to the values that we want to see in the community tech sector. Uh, the second thing we're doing is trying to identify and root out unforeseen and unintended patterns of exclusion in our application criteria and the, and the assessment process. So firstly, when we send your scored questions to the assessors for marking, we'll detach them from the rest of your application. So the assessors won't see any of the other information about your organisation other than what you put in answer to the scored questions. So they'll be judging your application just on your idea and how you support marginalised communities and not on any other information about who you are and what you do. Secondly, 
Um, after both stages of assessment, which is the initial SIFT, where we check that you qualify as a community business, and the second stage, where we're going to score your question answers, we'll look at the rejected applications and see if there are any patterns of unintended discrimination. So, for example, if after the SIFT we discover that all the applications from disability-led organisations have been rejected, we'll go back to the assessors to find out why in each case. And if it's because they've all failed on the same thing, then we might have to reassess whether that criterion presents an unfair barrier to disability-led organisations and ask the assessors to discount it. So we really hope that these measures are going to lead to a more level playing field and with equal access to funding for all communities. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rosie. Um, now it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce Dan Such, who is the founder of CAST, a multidisciplinary team of digital experts that are helping organisations use digital for social good. And they're going to talk about the Community Explore free digital design programme that the Discovery Fund will offer all successful candidates. So over to you, Dan. Thank you so much, Ms. Anna, for that. What an amazing introduction, A, to the programme, also to go look at the, the incredible intention and, uh, and focus you've given to that application process. It's brilliant to hear, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. It's very nice to be here. Um, thank you for uh, giving me some time to ex explore this. I'm just gonna share my screen to talk through a few slides. Uh, in time on a tradition, can you wave when you can see that, please? Fantastic, thank you very much. So I'm Dan, I'm from, uh, I'm from a charity called CAST. Um, we were set up eight years ago to help other mission-driven social organisations to figure out how to best use digital in their work and to respond to how people are using digital in their, in their daily lives to ensure that our work aligns with those patterns of behaviour and need. Um, I put that as a starting point, our kind of main focus, which is on accelerating the presence, influence and agency of social impact organisations in the technologies that affect us all. What that really means outside of kind of marketing speak is we work around kind of the agency, how can we help people develop the skills, the capabilities, the opportunities to use technology well. The presence, how can we help mission driven organisations develop tools that build on their values so that it's their tools that they are able to use and influence and use. And then finally, how can we develop a sector and a voice that builds from the principles and the values of, of the community, of the, of the kind of wider sector to influence other, other technologies too. So that the ethics and the values of the sector are built into the technologies that influence all of our lives. One of the things that we've been doing for, for the last few years to help work towards this mission is we uh, we started and now incubate a, a big network called Catalyst. And one thing that I urge you all to do is have a look at the catalyst.org.uk for a huge range of resources and support that help you think about how, how digital is being used elsewhere, how community organisations are using digital. Um, and also have resources that can help you as you're thinking through the application process and what you might want to do. But more specifically, we're here today to talk about Community Explore. Um, Community Explore is a program of support that's designed to kind of sit alongside you as you work through the discovery um, program, as you work through, through the funding. Um, it's intended to be kind of flexible, to align with the way in which you're working, but it's trying to bring other experience and expertise to help you make the best of the grant that, that hopefully you will receive. One of the values of this funding approach is, as Fergus mentioned, is it's really flexible. It, it's intended to cover the time to go through that really deep discovery and research phase, to go through that inquiry, to then put the prototype and test out new ideas and new approaches. That's something that we've got lots of experience in doing and helping other charities, other nonprofits, and mission driven organizations to do and, and explore. Community Explore is a program that we use to support organizations as they're going through those well trodden processes. So, the intention then is a program of support for those who are funded to help you deliver uh, the kind of the very best, most kind of deeply thought through and researched approaches to your digital products or services. And it's a balance of support for those of you that are doing it and training for those of you who are less confident to ensure that you can be as successful as possible. Uh, we worked with um, actually thousands of organisations providing this type of support, hundreds more specifically through this Explore programme. But what I'll, do, what I'll do now is just very briefly kind of explain what it might look like and think about um, kind of whether it might be suitable to support you in the work that you're trying to do. Um, the only slide with lots of text. First thing to say about this one is um, 
I've just said this is kind of flexible support. This describes the approach where, we, where we've last used it with a cohort of 10 other social organisations. Um, and it was designed as a 12 week programme to support them to go through that discovery phase and then through what we call a definition phase of testing out those prototypes. And it was timed because it worked well for their work. As we look at the ideas that are coming through, the teams that are being selected and the way in which you're looking to work on the, kind of the cadence and pace of your work. So we'll kind of shift this a little bit to make sure it aligns with what you're doing. But essentially the, the ambition here is to help you ensure that you can kind of set up and manage and deliver your, your digital project in the best way possible using tools, processes, services that have worked really well for other mission driven organizations that are trying to do similar sorts of work. For some of you, if, this is, if, you, if you're coming to this relatively kind of new from, from a digital perspective, then you'll hopefully leave with a better understanding of the support to have the confidence to, to deliver well. And for those of you who have got experience in delivering great tech products already and you're looking to kind of go through it again, then there's another group where we can help connect you with other people with, with more kind of resources and support. What might that look like? Something a little bit like this. You'll see that it's a mixture of, well, first of all, it's, it's set over two phases. So specific support around the discovery phase. Like how can we really understand the needs, the behaviours, the expectations of our community, of the people who might be using the tools? How can we work with them using well understood processes like user and community research, like co-design and participation, depending on the, the approach you're taking, to really inform that understanding of kind of what the needs are that you need to address for this product to work well or this service to work well. And the second phase, the definition phase, is where we really think about what are the different ways in which we can, can solve those problems that have been identified clearly within the discovery phase. And that is one of the Got real values of linking back into the community of practice that both Fergus and Rosanna mentioned. Is part of that definition phase saying what already exists, what are the things that we can build on that are already community owned or community built, or we can test out using new things like no code or low code options to really get great confidence our new approach is going to work. So it's split across those two phases, timed in line with kind of the work that you're doing. So it sits alongside the work you're trying to trying to deliver. Um, and you'll see, as an example, there's a whole range of whether it's kind of masterclasses or peer sessions or linking to the community, um, a chance to kind of go through some kind of really kind of well timed sessions like retros and planning sessions that are quite familiar within the tech world. Um, there's a whole range of both kind of asynchronous support, access to resources and services, but also some synchronous kind of direct one to one and kind of small group work to make sure we're as productive and effective as possible. Lots to explore love to see how we can help you. One thing that we know is having done this so many times, we know that if people are allowed to align this with the funding they have and the work they're doing, we know we can see an increase in kind of the maturity of our sector and us as individuals. We know that we're going to leave with more confidence in how best to design tools that work well for our communities and for our organisations. Um, we get better understanding of the people we're trying to work with and, and, and support. Um, and of course, we get greater connections with both others who are working, doing similar work, but also with the other products, services and things that are available can help us in our work. A really quick rattle through. I think this funding opportunity is amazing. I'm delighted you're here today and I'd love it if we can support you in any way. Um, if you do, then our email address is there, so please do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, it's really great to hear more about the Community Explore Digital Design Programme that's on offer as part of this funding opportunity and also to see how people who are coming to this application process with like the seed of an idea can also get that tailored support to actually deliver um, on that idea and um, and also build, build skills in a really supportive environment. So thanks for kind of taking us through that process and that journey. Um, and now um, to close this first part of the webinar before our break, um, we're going to hear from two community businesses who have already undertaken a journey of discovery and are now using their own community tech. So just a reminder to pop your questions in that Q&A box along with your name and organisation. Um, and we'll come to questions before we break, um, just before two. So first up, I'm delighted to introduce Ben McKenna from Solidaritech, a brilliant community business based in Bradford. So over to you, Ben. Hi, everyone. Just switching on the old screen sharing now, so bear with me a second. Right. Um, 
Hello everyone, um, my name's Ben, I'm the founder and CEO of Solid Aritech. and um, put simply, what we do is we combat digital exclusion. We've got a very specific client group and that is asylum seekers and refugees in Yorkshire and Humber. And quite often with the socioeconomic circumstances that asylum seekers and refugees face, they are the least, the most digitally excluded people and they're quite often people that, that need the, the most digital technology to do what they want to do so take you through that and take you through our kind of community tech journey I guess you'd probably call it we look at exclusion through a sort of intersectional model so there are overlaps between a lack of technology so I don't have a phone I don't have a laptop I don't have a tablet as well as a lack of skills and a lack of data and these things can compound and sometimes in triplicate and also they link into a lot of different other types of exclusion and um, we just try and raise the bar a little bit in that one and we try and help people every other possible way that we can so we work with a lot of local refugee and asylum seekers support agencies to achieve that um Put simply, we don't actually care what our tech is used for. Um, we, we don't give a monkey what you do with it. And, and quite honestly, if it helps you self-soothe and watch your favourite kids' TV shows, that's grand. But a lot of the people that we've surveyed from our users use it for these four things. So education, whether that's getting a better understanding of the English language or whether that's progressing um, qualifications from back home or converting them over to British standards. Or it might just be learning something new to take the chance to make yourself more employable when you get your status across or something like that. Also, people use it to find loved ones, to piece their life back together. It's a really tough part of, of, of the journey that they're on, and you know, metaphorically and actually. And um, it, sometimes technology is very, very useful for doing that, for finding people that might have been dispersed over a wide area from a conflict or from persecution or something like that. And it takes time and it takes access. Also, and this is something we all do, um, our technology is used to access services. Um, a lot of the problem with the digital by default agenda is that it's an exclusion by default agenda for all sorts of reasons that are socioeconomic that we've already sort of touched on. And that touches on the settled population as well as the, the migrant population, she says. And obviously the last one is that it's quite often used to progress legal cases. Um, we're pleased, we're proud to do that. We don't care what you use it for, but those are the things that we necessarily do. So I'm just going to quickly rattle through the process of how we do what we do to give you an understanding of what we've used the community tech for. Um, but yeah, people and organisations donate their old tech. We get all of the data off them to make sure that those donors have no problems with those data being left on. And then we make sure that those, those machines are safe we don't want to burn it down anyone's house or electrocute anyone or the battery blowing up or all of that stuff and then we donate it out to people so we work using 100 percent donated equipment it's very rare we'll buy a full machine we might buy some parts or something like that but we very rarely um, actually go out and buy machines for our core projects and that's something we, we try and keep all the time and um, we work with a lot of people we wipe all the data off you don't really need to know that but the roughly this is what our numbers look like at the moment and this is kind of the i guess the understanding of all of our constituents we have our donors we have our organizations that request stuff from us for the for the people that they support we have uh, the people that we work with the volunteers the help the languages and we also help people with data provision and that sort of stuff um so I guess really the question and why we're on this journey is how do we organize that chaos? And that's really the, the problem that we've stuck across. And short answer is that this is not our actual sheet, but it's a big, ugly, horrible, innavigable Excel sheet that's open to everyone, loads of different editors, stuff was really hard to trace. Sometimes people would well-meaningly try and change the fonts or the colors or whatever, and that would completely ruin everything um and we were struggling you know we were struggling to do what we do quickly you know in, in an efficient way reliably and all of that kind of thing so our community tech solution to that is a system that manages all this and that is what we call solid crm which is our little system uh, it fits with civi crm so it sort of sits between wordpress and civi crm and handles all of our kind of caseloads and handles everything from start to finish so if i guess really what you would call this would be a provenance engine we're actually interested in where it's coming from and we've used the, the funding for um, the community tech makes and maintainers funds to develop this system so we have a 
farm to table approach of everything. So the machine comes in, it gets tagged, it goes through initial check-in, it goes through data wiping, it goes through the technician working on it, and then it goes through distribution and going out to someone. And at the end of that, when everything is connected up and it all works beautifully, the person who originally donated gets a, a little text or an email to say, thank you, you've made a difference to someone's life today. But actually, on top of the kind of customer client relations stuff, it also gives the people that we work with who donate the tech to us a massive amount of confidence that we have this tracking thing the whole way through. Um, so in terms of the future, um, this has meant a massive amount to us. It's meant that I have some dedicated time to actually go out and get people onto the system, to use the system and to train our volunteers and to train our staff and all of that kind of stuff. So it's widened participation for us, but also the funding has helped us to communicate more in the open, think about our communications from me on a personal level, but also um, organizational communications. And it's helped us really kind of supercharge what we do and been a massive, massive help. So thank you for everyone. And I couldn't recommend these guys, um, this fund uh, more than possibly can. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ben. Great to hear yes. about the work and and thanks for sharing around how you work in the open and um, I really encourage people to look at the Solidarity Tech website and, and check out all of the learnings that's on there. Um, we're now going to hear from Sarah Bentley of Trinity Community Arts based in Bristol. So over to you, Sarah. Hello, I'm just going to share my screen. Um... Hopefully it's the right one. Okay. And then I go, apologies, everyone. It's my first time doing this. Okay. That worked. Um, okay, so my name's Sarah Bentley. Um, I'm the communications and development manager at Trinity Community Arts. We're based in Bristol. Um, we're a multi-use community arts center. Oh, I'm just gonna sorry, put my timer on, I'm aware of that. Um uh, uh it's based in the old market area of Bristol. We welcome about 60,000 people per year, which was actually, and we're kind of, we've just had our first year pre-COVID, so that's about right now, across a program of private hires, so clubs and weddings, and then our in-house program. And our locality is in Lawrence Hill, which is um, the lowest serve deprivation in the UK, according to the council's index, but the high cultural engagement comparatively to across Bristol. Um, this is a picture of our garden part in our outside space. Um, so we use free and open source software um, because it's enabled us to build as an organization. Um, this is a photo that I found in our archive, which I think is great, which is um, many moons ago, our youth music course where we had like donated computers and we had our own network and we use free and open source software to deliver free to access free, free music lessons for people that needed it or wanted it. Um, we currently use um, Civi CRM. Um, which is an open source um, data management system, which actually um, a colleague, uh, one of the co founders just talked about it a moment ago. Um, and we did quite a lot of work on that to enable us to um, really kind of understand our data and how we segment, da segment the data, and also to enable us to gather kind of impact and monitoring information, which is really good for an organization because we have to report upon that. Um, however, what 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 we need to kind of build upon and kind of um, make better, I suppose, is our functionality of ca capturing data, um, because where Civi CRM is very good at sending information out to people, and we've got forms and you know feedback that actually the people that are likely to fill that in are the people that are likely to fill it in, and um, it can be very difficult every year to get the community based data. Um, so. I've put this slide in to show um, an example of an event that we might be collecting, wanting data from, or we want to understand where people are or can connect to them. There's obviously lots of stuff going on. So we'll see that the CRM is great, but how do we kind of connect the two together and maintain that in a way that is um, increases our bus business functionality? That's our kind of question. Um, so what we're going to be doing with our funding is um, we've kind of, it's a great bit of funding really because it's enabled us to think which is great because it's flexible um, and what we want to do is we recognize that the CRM uh, and the development we've done it is really powerful 
But what we want to do is we recognize that we're just making that at the moment. We haven't really got buy-in with other people to kind of talk to us, our users, about what they want data, um, how they want their data and the questions around that. So what we're going to be doing is um, improving our CRM to create uh, to have it as a, a better digital data collection platform to meet the need of grassroots community organizations. So I think the key is about working in the open is that we want to develop tech with open source and give it and put it not give it back to the community in a way that we would expect people to maintain it but make it a free resource that people can use particularly smaller organizations because as an organization we can't buy tools we could I'm, i suppose we could we could sign up for a crm but it's quite expensive and it doesn't really meet our needs so and we recognize that's not just our a problem that we face so we're going to be working with stakeholders to co-create um this platform it will be connecting, it will be building upon and the tech that we've already got. Um, we're going to try and understand how other organizations um, use and process data. So part of ours as well is getting funders in the room and starting to ask questions about why are we gathering some of the data that we're gathering as well. So it's a really, for us, it's great. So we can then work our CRM and make it fit to purpose. Um, and then we want to understand how end users can take ownership of their data. And actually, some of that is really coming out of the work that we're currently doing with um, promising trouble and power to change around questions around community data, data ownership, which I don't know the answer to at the moment. I wish I did. Um, um, and this is just how we're going to be making the tech because we recognize that we need to make we need lots of people's input. So we're going to go for a four by with process, which is who's the tech for and who needs to be in those conversations, who's creating it, who's going to be making it and who's going to be part of it and consultants in the process. Um, and this is just information about us. If you want to follow us, um, cheeky little plug. So there's our Insta, Facebook, Twitter and Mastodon. Um, and yeah, hit me up if you want to chat. I'm Sarah at TrinityBristol.org.uk. Thank you very much. And I did it in time. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Really amazing to see how you're co-creating a platform that others can also benefit from kind of using this open source approach and also loved your four by with framework that you shared. I, th I thought that was great. So thank you so much. And um, we've had some questions coming through and we've got some more to answer. Um, so now if, you, if you've got more, please do send them through. We're going to have a few minutes to answer some Q&As before the break. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rosie, who's going to field some of those questions now. And I think Fergus is going to take them unless they're directed at other, other people. So over to you, Rosie, to kind of lead us through that part. Great, thanks. So um, I will, I'll start with the, so some of the questions have been answered in the question and answer facility, but I can still read them out, but I'll start, start with ones that haven't been um, answered so far. So um, uh, Rachel, I, I can answer this one to start with. Rachel Kelly is asking whether we can elaborate on our definition of a marginalized community, um, would rurally excluded be included? So. Um, the definitions of marginalised communities are set by uh, the Arts Council England that we use, and they are people from minoritised ethnicities, people with disability, LGBTQIA, younger people who are under 35, older people who are over 60, people who are economically and educationally disadvantaged, and I think you could probably make a case that you know, but if you're rurally cut off in a rural area, you might be economically disadvantaged. Um, long term unemployed, people with experience of homelessness, women and girls, ex offenders and people with refugee status or, or migrancy experience. So that's that's what we mean when we are talking about um, when we're talking about uh, marginalised communities, Rachel. Um, OK, so. Fergus. Um, Abigail from uh, Cash, Community Assets for ha Society and Housing, which is a London-based CBS and CLT, says, would they be eligible if their project is about EDI within housing cooperatives and outreach to communities who are not accessing co-ops? Um, so it sounds as if that they would meet the community business defini the definition, potentially, but I suppose it's more about um, that it's around when you look when we're sort of doing this slightly wrong way around because like we haven't gone through what the uh, application questions and the eligibility questions are so abigail might decide from there that if it's that if she's right or not but um 
so potentially, depending on what the challenge is, that, that, that you would say if the challenge, you, you've set out the challenge there, and then if you then, in the, in the answers, you sort of set out that why you'd want to explore that from a community tech perspective. So the fact that you want to develop a solution that you own and that will, might benefit others. And if you can make the case for that, then I can't see why it wouldn't be eligible. But it's more the fact that, um, yeah, wait, we, but to be able to answer that question more fully, we need to know we need to see the the, the second stage of the, of the presentation in a sense if that makes absolutely and i think on a sort of similar vein uh, ishan from the founder of travel hands who's a which is a cio organization he says an uber for visually impaired people where they find volunteers for outdoor travel that sounds great uh they've they've built the app and now um they'd like to add wheelchair users to this app so they're asking about their eligibility so not knowing much about the organization, but like in terms of what they're doing there, you can have it. Yes. And this answers some of the other ones that I've answered already. You could have an existing solution, but you have a new challenge that you want to explore around that, which so the question you've got, the challenge you want to say is how do we work with wheelchair users and how do we get to get to use the app? So that in itself would be a useful uh, avenue for discovery for that feasibility thought. And that you would then go through the discovery for sort of understanding what the needs of the user are. And then you would go through the sort of definition phase phase of like actually thinking about what technology is out there. Is there something that already exists or do you need to create something new? And that would be part of that would be that line of inquiry would fit well with the program. Brilliant. OK, um, so there are there's various questions about um, eligibility, like you said, they're coming. So Rhiannon wanted to know, uh, you know, she says she's a CIO rather than a community business and are nonprofits eligible for funding. So. Yes. So, yes. See, so basically, we're going to cover this later, but community businesses cover all different kinds of, um, of, of governance structures. So you can be a charity, a CIO, a cooperative, a community benefit society. There's no, there's no such thing as sort of a community business governance structure. So there can be all those things. So we'll go into more detail about what actually makes a community business. But being a CIO is probably, you know, a, you've, you've got it in your governance document locked in about what your statement, your, how you're going to support communities. So that's, that's a good starting point. In that sense, and and that that, that answer also um, answers Tony Lazar's question, which was about whether whether this is just for charities only or whether it can be a business. And, and no, a community business can be a business or a charity or lots of other business forms. Yeah, it could um, be a limited company by guarantee. It could be you know, there's lots of yeah, lots of forms. Okay, so Laura wants to know whether organisations can apply in collaboration and whether Scotland Scottish organisations can apply. Yeah, so you could you could uh, you can apply in collaboration. So you know we we would look at collaboration quite you know favourably. Uh, we wouldn't so we wouldn't chuck it. We wouldn't say no to collaborations. But my advice would be to have one lead organisation, which then would de demonstrate who they are and that they are a community business. And then within your question, within your answers to the other questions, to the, then talk about who you're working with in terms of your partners. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's question number four, like three. And when we go further along, about like who, are, how will you look at this program, this challenge? And that's when you would say you, you would say, oh, "I'm going to work with others in partnership." Um, and in terms of uh, the Scotland question, we are, so as the way that Power to Change is set up is that we can only fund England-based organisations. So hopefully, your partner would be an English-based community business if you are in Scotland, and then that would be eligible. But if it was a Scottish-based organisation, then unfortunately not. Right. Guy Price wants to know whether a project has to build or be developing new software or hardware, or can they uh, focus on exi existing tech platforms and use these to create new solutions? Yeah. There's no real hard and fast rule on this. Like, as in, like, so I explained before, you could have an existing piece of technology which you're already working on, and then you've got a new piece, a new idea alongside that you want to explore. That'd be fine. Um, and really, the, the, the piece is that you can have existing technology, but it's all depending about how much influence and control over you have that technology to be able to say if it's community tech or not. If, you, if you're just buying off the shelf and you have no influence other than the data you put in, then I wouldn't say that aligns with the values of community tech. But then if you were able to, if you were taking that existing piece of technology out of the, com out of the commons or you were, say, using... Um, I mean, a sort of halfway house is like the sort of no code sort of a situation where you can like be designing your own solutions, but within a sort of a part, like, I don't want to get too technical here, but um, in a proprietary so in a software. So it, it's hard to say on a, on a, on that broadness, but I'd say the, the key here is that to understand um, where the benefit will be realized and how much influence and control over you've got over that solution. But 
the whole this 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 whole discover process would help you know we think about from the beginning you'd go out discover user needs and then you would then do the definition of thinking about where what technology already exists uh, and then if you went through that process then you would say right you know there's, there's off the shelf stuff that you might use or there's an option here that actually designing it ourselves would be beneficial so like, if people come through this process there's an, I, and they get to the stage at the end of it and say actually you know we can we can get we can meet this challenge by taking something off google then that's you know that's fine we don't we're not forcing people to go down the route of developing community tech for community tech sake we're saying that you know we want you to explore this and if community tech solution if you're developing it yourself is right for you then that's great and we, but we want to give you the space to be able to explore that great and rachel i think that also you, you seconded guy's question and and i hope that answer from fergus also answers yours um there's a few more coming in drew richardson from york volunteer center manager um he says he's already done a really long discovery process with his communities and worked out a volunteering brokerage digital solution for our local v vcse sector and volunteer communities um and they've even got funding to buy something off the shelf and it was going well for a year until the company that owned the platform brought in a new payment plan and paywalled loads of the features making it inaccessible to the majority of our communities we're not a tech organization ourselves we now need funding to make a replacement digital solution for us the volunteer centers and the local vcse organizations of local volunteers and by us but most importantly owned by us so he's asking, is Discovery the right funding for us? It could very well be. I mean, it would be the fact that you would look at that situation from a, from a new. So, like, you know, you would say you would go through, like, um, you basically you've got lots of all existing uh, resources to pull into this new Discovery process, but you would have to go through this process again like, from the perspective of, like, the fact you want to develop it yourself. So I, I would say that it is. So just because you've been through it before, once before, that's that's fine. And you've got to a situation where it hasn't worked out. And I think that what you that that example just goes to show about really why community tech is so important, because you are at the 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 whim of these cor these these corporate solutions. So you know, um, I would say yes, but all depending on you know that would be up to them to make that decision. But it sounds, um, yeah, viable. There is a, another question in the question, but I'm just going to skip over to the chat box because we did have a couple of questions in there and I don't want to forget about them. So Sarah Kennedy, Kenny, sorry, Kenny asked, is there anywhere we can fund to go to, is there anywhere you can go for funding a build after this development stage? If we work with our community to explore a tech possibility, but there's no way of ever building it, it's another example of talking about something amazing, but not being able to create it due to a lack of in infrastructure and resource. Or is this grant for organisations who have significant resource and core funding who can take this further? Good question. And like, um, and I'm going to answer this question honestly. So like, uh, ideally, this would be the like point uh, eight. This would be a full programme which we would be support. Would have opportunities at the end of this to then support you going on. Unfortunately, the way that it's got, uh, it was designed initially like that, but unfortunately the way we, the situation we are now is that we can take you through to the end of the de definition phase. But we are working hard to find other funders to come in alongside us to then potentially take you on and, and to be able to come along and actually support that. So there's no promises there, but the idea is that we, what we're gonna do is try and set you, set organizations up to be uh, most, like, not fundable, but to, to be set you up in a position where, you know, you will be, uh, more likely to be able to take your project forward. So we're going to have this demo day at the end of this, and then we will invite everyone to present where they've got to. We've been inviting social investors into that. We'll be inviting other funders to come along, uh, and we will be helping you to work on your pitches to try and take this further. So to say it's wasted, I'm not sure, but uh, I, I totally understand the the point that you know this is seems to be part of the solution, but it's not the full the not not the full picture, uh, and that's. And that's that's going to be a decision that you will have to make uh, with that, knowing that information, but like we can get you so far, and then we will then be looking to help you go that next step next step further. But we just haven't got the resources at this stage to say that we can do that. So, right. And I just wanted to address a comment that Joanne Taylor has left, or rather, I want Fergus to address the comment. Um, so she says that her platform idea is a community infill development tool that allows residents to ambitiously design and fund the repurposing of land in their community to design out beds in sheds and social behaviour, drug dealing, fly tipping, crime access, 
and designing 24-7 friendly footfall through buildings, facilities and services. There are two platforms necessary to achieve this. The first to design procurement and planning tool for local residents. The second is a tool to identify unregistered land which will require access to land registry data. And this is available for free through the Geovation Accelerator. I'm not, she says she's not sure she'll be able to get onto this with a charity or kick structure, community interest company structure. Her thought was a social enterprise limited by shares, which she then says this, this program discovery won't accept. So she's not sure what to do. But yeah, is she right, Fergus, that we wouldn't accept a social enterprise limited by shares structure? So I'm a little bit, I mean, I assume that uh, limited by shares would be like, there's different ways of limited by shares. So you have community shares and you have like a private, so that would be a, a kick limited by shares, I suppose, social mm -hmm. enterprise. And um, and it's not to say that um, it, the, the, the challenges around due, due, uh, through the due diligence process is that understanding where, the, where, um, where value is then distributed. So where would profits be going? And like, you know, putting public money into an organization which then distributes its funding to, to potentially through to shareholders is a challenge. So I would say it's challenging, but uh, I'm, I was more intrigued by the idea around the about the initial platform, sorry. But uh, I think it's one to, one to look at and we, I'm happy to have that conversation offline about like uh, and beforehand to see if uh, we can mitigate any risk of her um, before she gets in. Great. So I know we're running out of time, but I just want to uh, just one. There was a question aimed at Dan, um, which someone says they want to join the CAST program, but not necessarily, you know, can they join it without getting on the Discovery Fund? So, um, Dan, if you'd be prepared to answer that in public, I know you've answered it privately, too. Yeah, thank you. So we've got a range of funds. This one is being very specifically designed to sit alongside the funding, but we have other programmes that are open and free. Um, so if you get in touch, I'll, I'll drop my email address again, but it's just hello at wearecast.org.uk, uh, drop a line and we can point you and, and help you find the right resources and support. That's great. Um, Anne-Marie Afton, uh, last question before we go on a break, says um, she's from the Digital Arts Products Community Interest Company and they run workshops in digital arts and tech in disadvantaged communities. They've got a complex set of users, partners and customers, which they need a bespoke CRM solution to deal with. They've identified another community interest company who can de develop bespoke CRM tools. Would, we, would she be able to use the Discovery Fund to develop a so solution with them? Um, and she, she says she guesses it's using an existing solution, but adding bespoke elements to deal with our complex organization. So the, the fund will be for them to work out what their needs are and then what, what different options are, there, that are available, which that their potential partner could be one of those options. So I would say that it would give them a, better, a lot better uh, positioning to be able to then work out what the next steps they want to take. So it would be let them to look, user needs, exactly finding out what they need and then thinking about what the different options are. And it could be that, yeah, like I say, that option might be one of them, but there might be others. There might be, you know, the work, the Civi tech that uh, the one that Ben uses, or, you know, there might be CRMs that Sarah use or those other ones out there it, within open source or outside of uh, proprietary stuff, which there might be more appropriate. So in answer, it, it would give them a better that she would be in a better position to uh, to then talk to and go out there and find a solution going forward well very cheeky last question from an anonymous attendee so they want to clarify will the fund fund build costs or is it just to explore ideas um so it, it's built it, it's uh it's exploring the ideas but there will be an opportunity to spend to do some prototyping so you know if you're thinking that you know you might want to um uh yeah you need, need to do some prototyping then that could be covered but yeah it's not to take the next step of of the actual full-on build lovely that's all our questions so perfectly in time for the break Thanks, Rosie. Um, thank you so much for your questions. Thanks to our speakers, Dan, Ben and Sarah as well for talking to us about your work. We're going to have a short comfort break. Um, so we'll see you back in five minutes at 2 p.m. When we come back, we'll be discussing the process of applying for the funding and how the applications will be assessed. So enjoy a short screen break, a stretch, and we will see you at 2 p.m.
Okay. Um, welcome back. Hopefully um, you had a refreshing little break. Um, we are coming into the final section of this webinar. Um, this part is all about the process of applying for the funding and how those applications will be assessed. You can find all of this information on the discovery page of the Power to Change website. Um, and Rosie's going to pop the link to that in the chat now. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Rosie, um, who's going to tell us a bit about the fund's eligibility criteria and then talk us briefly through the application form. A reminder again to just pop those questions into the Q&A box and we will have some time to get to them um, at the end of this session. Over to you, Rosie. Great, thank you very much. Fergus, as I'm talking, would you mind putting the, the discovery page in the chat? That would be super helpful. Oh, why am I not skipping forward? Fantastic. So I'm going to talk you through the eligibility cr criteria and the application form. Um, so we've tried to keep the eligibility criteria really simple for discovery. So basically any organisation that can demonstrate that it fits our community business criteria is eligible to apply. So don't worry at all if you've never heard of the phrase community business before. Um, and you don't think of yourself as one, as we've said in the questions, as long as you can explain how you meet the four community business conditions, which I'm going to talk you through in a minute, then that's absolutely fine. As far as we're concerned, you're a community business. It doesn't matter at all what you call yourself. Um, and we're trying to be as inclusive as possible in, a, in assessing how you meet the full community business criteria. We want it to be a, as big a tent as possible. So um, there's a few other conditions that relate to, uh, you know, how power to change was set up and the fact that we give out public money. That means that there are a few other criteria that I'm going to talk you through now. So uh, we're an English funder, so your business has to be operating uh, in England. Um, you need to be incorporated. And if you're a business, you've got to have more than one director. We don't fund sole traders and we don't fund single director businesses. Um, you absolutely don't have to be a charity, uh, but your community business must have a charitable purpose. So charitable purposes are 13 broad categories defined by the 2011 Charities Act. They include things like the prevention or relief of poverty or the advancement of education. So when you fill in the application form, we'll ask you to select one of those from the applicant from the list. Um, you must operate for public benefits. We don't fund businesses that make profit for private use. Um, the money you make needs to be reinvested in your community business and your community. So the start of the application form has an eligibility checker, which asks you to confirm that you meet all of these criteria. And I think you can answer maybe and still go through, but we'd really rather if you don't know that you definitely do meet an eligibility criteria, please, please email us on communitytech at powertochange.com because we can't fund maybes. We can only fund definitely yeses. So it's much, much better to not waste your time and ours that we work out whether you are eligible or not. And we're very, very happy to talk to anyone about that. OK, so. Lastly, on this slide, I've just highlighted open working. So this is not a formal uh, formal eligibility criterion, but um, oops, we do want all uh, all the people that uh, we fund through through discovery to commit to open working. So if you're not prepared to do that, you need to think seriously about whether this is the right fund for you. OK, so let's talk through the community business criteria. There's four of them, and I know some people do struggle with them. Um, so locally rooted, that's the first one. So your organisation will have been started by people who live in your area and they've started it because they've noticed something that needed changing and they needed doing um, and they decided to do something about it. So, you know, your community businesses might have grown big, bigger since then, but, um, but it is still linked to a place and it has a direct connection with that place. Um, okay. So you've got to be accountable to your local community as well. So that means that local people must have a really genuine say in how your organisation is run. And there's loads of different ways you can do this. You might be a co-op where members have voting rights. You might be a charity with lots of local people on your board of trustees. Um, you might be a company that just, you know, goes out and does a lot of interaction with local people. Uh, and, and use their feedback to feed back into your decision making. The main thing is you've got to show how local people can have a meaningful influence on your decision making in your, in your, in your community business. You're answerable to your local community. 
So trading for the benefit of the local community, this kind of has two parts. One is that there must be some element of trade, some element of earned income in your business model. You, you can't just be a, an organisation that's funded by grants. Uh, it can be a really small part um, that you, you know, you're hoping to grow in the future and it's very small now, but you must say, you know, earn some money for room hire or you have a cafe or, you know, on a bigger scale, you do a contract for the local authority, but there must be some element of trade in there. Secondly, the money that you earn and any profits your company you make, they must be used for the benefit of your local community, not pocketed by shareholders. If you're lucky enough to make a profit, you need to reinvest that in your business or your community. And lastly, you need to have broad community impact. So we're trying to be as flexible about as possible on this. Um, uh, so your organisation, we want your organisation to have an impact on a broad range of people in your local community, just not on one specific group, like say young mums or school children. But we will accept applications from organisations that work with a community of experience in a place, as long as they can demonstrate broad impact within that community. So, for example, an organisation that would provide a range of services to people with mental health problems in a, in a, in a village would qualify, but an organisation that provides services only to pensioners with mental, mental health problems in their village probably wouldn't, because that's not a broad enough impact. Okay. Oops. Sorry, just let's get the next slide up. So, onto the application form. Um, the first thing I want to say about this is there's a super, 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 super helpful uh, guidance for you for the application form on uh, on the discovery web page. The email address is here and I think Fergus has put it in the chat. So everything I say here is in this document and much, much more. So I strongly advise you to go and check that out. OK, so the application form is nine pages long. But most of the questions just require you to answer simple answers or select options from a list. There's not that many questions that are assessed within those nine pages. Um, general tips about filling in the application form. Don't forget to put your email address and create a password so you can save your application and come back to it when you need. Don't then forget what your password is. That was quite a big issue with the last lot of makers and maintainers applications, lots of forgotten passwords. We can't find out what your password is for you, so you need to remember it. Um, don't forget to save your application regularly while you're doing it because uh, that the, provided lots of frustration for lots of people when they didn't do that. Okay, so um, uh, lastly, also, if you want to print a copy, if you want to save a copy of your application, you need to print it and you can print it as, as a PDF that you can send saved to your, your um, computer, but that's, that's how you will get a, you don't, you're not going to be emailed a copy of your application when you submit it. So if you want a copy for yourself, you need to print it to save. Okay, so the first part of the application form on page one is the eligibility, eligibility check. Like I said, it will say, do you meet all these criteria? You really need to check yes um, to carry on. Um, and don't check yes if the answer is no, because we will find out. We will do due diligence. Um, the second page is contact details. The third page is details of your organisation. Uh, on that is the first kind of long text box that says what do you do and where, but this is this is not an assessed question, we just want a real top line example, an uh, uh, explanation of what your, com what your community business is and what you do. Um, also on this page is a question on what action that you're taking to address the climate crisis. Again, this is because we want to know about what our grantees and, and our applicants are doing for this. It's not an assessed question, um, but we're very interested to know what actions people are taking, but it's just for our own information and data gathering. Lastly, on this page, there's postcodes of impact. Um, we, so we're not going to, so it's important to us to know whether you're working in a deprived uh, area. Um, in, in some of our in some and we'll use these three postcodes that you give us to to work out an average uh, average index of de you know, multiple deprivation for your area we won't use this as a decision making tool in funding you but we definitely want to know where you're working and how that relates to rates of deprivation right page four is all about your community business criteria so this is the four questions with you'll get about 250 words per question where you tell us why you're a community business and if you've if you've applied to us before successfully 
then you can reuse your answers for this because if it worked before it will work now we want to know you're a community business we won't the way we assess if you you need to get past this stage to go on to the next stage so it's really important what you put in here and try really hard to explain what you do in terms that we will understand as a community business people who mark these questions will be past change staff um, and they will also look at details of your organisational structure and the other criteria that I went through before to check your eligibility, but they're not going to look at the rest of your application. And once they've decided whether you're eligible as a community business, that's their involvement done and you'll move through to the next round. Page five is discovery questions, questions specific to this programme. And these are the scored questions that you're going to be marked on. Um, Fergus is going to explain after this uh, how, how the assessment process works. So these questions are part of that assessment process. They're the second stage of it. Again, you've got there are five questions and you've got up to 250 words, 1,500 characters per answer. Um, both. So each question is scored from zero to five in the brilliant guidance document. And in fact, in the application form, it defines what makes an answer at each of those score point levels. So it's really, really, really helpful to see what you need to put in your answer to score highly. Um, and these are going to be assessed not by the people who looked at the community business criteria, but people with um, experience in community tech. And they, those people they're not going to see again any other part of your application form they're just going to look at these five questions and judge you on your ideas about what your you know idea for discovery is and also about how you support marginalized communities so your total score for this is uh you know will add up all the marks you get from the two the two people who've marked your your questions so your highest a perfect mark would be 50 for those and we're going to recommend the highest scoring applications will be recommended for funding okay so these are the application questions there's five of them they're set out as statements that you fill in so the challenge we want to explore is we want to explore it because ways we're going to do it why you want to have a community tech approach and the last question that i talked through before um the organization supports marginalized communities by there is extensive guidance on what what kind of thing we're asking for um, when we're asking these questions so i'm not going to talk you through all of it now but if you go into the application form and you go into the guidance there will be a really big paragraph of explanation by what we're asking you when we're asking you to say the challenge we want to explore is and so on so go and check that Um, yes, so in terms of diversity, equity and inclusion, which is page six, this is on top of the things that I talked about earlier. So the, the questions here, there's lots of multiple choice questions here about uh, who you work with and who you're led by. And these are mainly for our power to change data and monitoring purposes. Um, they're not part of the assessment. However, if you do indicate in these questions that your organization's majority led by people with lived experience in one of the specified minoritized communities, then we will be checking as part of our, our process of assessment of looking for unintended patterns of exclusion, um, whether we will be looking at your application and seeing how it's fared through the different stages. Um, the, also, one innovation in discovery for this is that there's also a free text box underneath all these tick box things, um, multiple choice things. So we define a majority led organisation as an organisation that has more than 51% of people on your manage board, board or your senior, lead, senior leadership team with lived experience. But you might feel very strongly that even though you don't hit 51%, you definitely are. Uh, led by people from a minoritized community. So we've included in this section um, a box where you can explain why you should be considered as a majority led organization, even though you don't fit our exact definition of it. Okay. Um, page seven uh, and eight, I'm gonna hand over for, to Fergus for these, but um, these are all about uh, our due diligence checking which we do for all applications that we're thinking of funding and they're all about checking that you have policies in place for all the things we want and also you sharing your management accounts with us both the most recent ones that you filed 
uh, with Companies House or the Charities Commission uh, and the ones that you were actually your working accounts. So I'm going to hand over now to Fergus, who will talk you through uh, state subsidy, as I believe it's now called. Yes, thanks, Rosie. Um, so state aid uh, was basically uh, well, state aid doesn't exist anymore. It's called it's called subsidy, state subsidy. And what what state aid was was basically a mechanism when when we were in the EU or for EU European countries to um, sort of ensure a fair competition, so that, that the state wasn't investing in businesses and for those businesses to have a competitive advantage over other European uh, peers. So, I mean, you. What I thought one of the great things, I one of the, maybe one of the only benefits I have for myself from coming out of the EU would might be that I wouldn't have to start talking about state aid anymore. But unfortunately, part of the deal was that we would still do something around state aid, but it would now be called subsidy. And uh, so, taking that to consideration, we 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 apply. We looked at the the discovery, and we, it sort of met the four tests of if subsidy should apply. So, we, so basically, subsidy would apply. So going forward. What you're going to do in the application form, we will ask you to declare any previous state aid or subsidy that you have had before, and then you just basically put it down. If you've had any funding before that is eligible for state aid, you put it down, and basically there's a threshold of three hundred and fifteen fifteen thousand pound over a three year rolling period. So you put that down, and then it's a matter of uh, you put Evan down, and then in going forward, if you are awarded discovery money then if you do that again for another funder you would then put discovery in part of that so it would add to your 315k rolling total this is quite complex some people might have anything that might read this and not have anything to do with it but others might find actually i really want to uh understand more about this there's more details within the within the guidance but uh again if you do have a question just email in and we can see if we can help but uh the key here is to add anything that you feel is state aid or subsidy within the application form. There's lots of opportunities to do that. Um, and marketing preferences, basically, you know, this is where you start ticking boxes to say if you want us to contact you afterwards or not, or if you want a newsletter, all those, all that sort of thing. So that's uh, on page nine. Um, I do believe I'm on the next next slide. Is that right, Rosie? You're muted, by the way. Yes, it is me. Yeah. So basically, I just want to run through you now uh, around the, the discovery application process timeline. So we're in the midst of the, the, the uh, application window. So it started on the 1st of June and it runs over roughly an eight week period over the 21st of July. Uh, any parents out there might understand that it's the last day of the uh, before the summer holidays. So, you know, you might be in the end of your uh, the, your last day before you're going, you're jetting away or going on camping or whatever, then you're, you know, pressing send on your application. Uh, and then there's a, a, an assessment period between 21st of July and 6th of September. This is basically us going through the process that Rosie shared earlier. So the initial sift, going through the scoring and taking the those scores to a grant panel and then the highest scorers will then be awarded. Um, applications will be notified, all applicants will be notified uh, either before or on the 12th of September. And then successful applicants will be ex will be invited to attend, uh, basically, it's like a co-creation of the Community Explore setup meeting. So this is where we work with you to work out actually how will this work? What, what, what bits are you really wanting to see? Um, because it's hard to actually design something not knowing who the cohort, what what's going to the co what the makeup of the cohort is, but um, you know we've got Dan. You've saw Dan earlier. He's very keen to make sure that we structure this around everyone else's needs. So we were spending that session on the 18th to really, um, you know, build the nuances to make sure that this works for everyone. Um, next slide, please. So um, the program will start on the 1st of October. Uh, now that, that's when the funding starts. Okay, so the 1st of October, but the actual if you were, if you're, if you do want to take the community explore option up, that will not start until later in October to give you opportunity to line up, you know, the people who are going to take on, take it on board, making sure you've got free uh, your diaries free, those sort of things, and then that will run between October to March. So it'll run from October actually for the discovery phase until sort of mid December, and then we'll have a we'll take a break over that sort of festive period to make sure that you know we're not going to you know people start. Uh, clocking off early, but making sure that we have a little break in between before we start the second section of the def definition stage, and that will run from sort of mid-January through to March. Then we haven't got the 
exact date yet because we work with you to understand what works best for everyone we'll do a demo day and this is going to be you know this is going to be a really exciting day i'm looking forward to this day already so this is going to be where we, where we will be expecting we're asking everyone to share your progress we'll be sharing that with not just your fellow peers but with uh other funders investors other people who might be able to help you shape the next steps of your journey so we'll do that and then the end of the program will be march 2024 and within this period you'll be invited to join the community of practice and you know you'll be in, uh, engaging with rosanna and the team over there to understand how you can gain and benefit from that process so that's basically the timeline um i haven't got control this night so i presume that the next one's going to be q a there we go so uh over to you, Rosanna. Thanks, Fergus, and thank you, Rosie, for talking us through that. Um, now we've got a few minutes for questions on the application process, and um, Rosie, I think you're going to field some of those. Yes, I am. Okay. Lovely. So, uh, 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 let's have a look. Sorry, I was. I'm not totally on top of these because I was speaking. Um, so, Abigail Hammond says uh, regarding trading will be launching a community share offer, but not they're not quite there yet. Is that a problem? Hmm. Uh, so, um, so that's like basically potential future trading through membership. I would presume that's what they would, that would be, that if that's where the trading would be, because the actual share equity would be, might not be classed as trading because that would be uh, like money you might be investing, but that's, let's not get caught in the detail of that, but uh, that would be when, when you, if you were to go for this, then, and if you're not exactly trading now, then I would be making that if you feel as if it's still value of going through this process, then you can make the case to say, you know, well, you know, we are very close to trading and this is how we're going to do it, you know, and demonstrating that you are a community business, but on just on the cusp, that's about to be my advice. Um, but um, yeah, but that's, that's, that would be my advice. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> James Clayton from All Saints Landmark Centre in Bradford says, will the slides of this webinar be shared? Uh, yes, they certainly will, James. Um, and he found the slide of the eligibility criteria is much clearer than anything in the PDF or on the website. OK, that's really useful feedback. Thank you very much. I shall look and compare those and see if there's anything change to be done. Um, yeah, we'll put the whole of this webinar up um, next week, I should imagine, start of next week. Um, Sarah, Kenny, Sarah Kenny wants to know again, is it possible to apply uh, regarding open source tech that someone else is creating or already exists and perhaps use the money to adapt for, the, for your community? So definitely, yes. Working in the commons, you know, we, we fully uh, support that. That's exactly the sort of space we want to, you want to, we want to build on top of the shoulders of others. You know, we, this is, this is exactly where we want to be, but um, just to sort of remind you that this is for the, you know, the, you, you would go through your initial discovery of like finding out what your user need is, and then you would go you through your definition. And then it, through your definition, you might then land on that piece of tech that that's that's uh, that you've just described there. So rather than going into this process, knowing what the solution is going to be, you know, we would, I would recommend that you go into that process going, look, you know, this is the challenge you want to address. Look at what your user need is, find out what that is, and then get down to the, like get down to the definition stage and say, look, that, that might be one of many different options so uh yes and but yeah maybe thinking more about what the challenge is rather than having a def defined solution before you start the process right rhiannon uh says uh that we work to support isolated groups across the uk primarily refugees and asylum seekers but also other marginalized communities like older people and people with disabilities we support local people to set up social and community building activities, sorry, community building activities in their town and city. She says she thinks it, this probably wouldn't meet the threshold of locally led, but she wants to double check. This is always a challenge when I see so much enthusiasm and like, you know, you say, oh, well, but actually I, I, I think I agree that, you know, that, um, that I don't feel that does meet the, the eligibility criteria. So you would expect you to be of a place. Uh, and making that application rather than uh, like su supporting multiple places. So, um, yeah, I don't feel that would make the eligibility criteria. Such a shame. So much good work going on, isn't there? Um, okay. And Michelle Tucker from FamiliesThrivingTogether.org.uk um, 
she says we provide parenting programs to anyone parenting and aim to normalize parenting support as a charity we need to streamline our tech including paying for support to do this and support to manage admin services easier would this be eligible as it wouldn't be directly for the end user and she, she says she thinks she fits all the other criteria so i'm just reading that again so um so that i mean you would go with i would say that that you would look at this from the challenge, yeah, from the, what we set up. So you would look at this from the challenge. So what what is the challenge you want to address? And you, you would say that you know you've got lots of different tech, and then you would then make the case for why you want to then explore that. And what this process would do is help you to work out what your user needs is are. So what are your that could be your staff, it could be the people you're working with, what the needs are, and then help you to think about which. Like what sort of uh, define what the challenge is and what what sort of potential solutions there could be. So rather than so in the answer, yes, if that's what the challenge you've got is, is that you have, you know, you've got you're trying to you've got so many different pieces and you need to streamline it, and that's your challenge. And then then that's what I would recommend you take through as part of your um, application process. But rather than saying it's a you know um, trying to comment that that we would support that exact project. Yeah, lovely. And um, Rachel Kelly's got a really good question. Can she submit more than one idea? She's guessing that the answer to that is yes, as the assessed questions are anonymous. Um, I would, uh, I would, re I would recognize. So you would have to go through the process, the whole process again. So they would, she would have to put multiple applications in. Um, I would. To be honest, it's I'm I had, it's one of the things I haven't even I haven't thought of fully yet. So uh, I would say that uh, yeah, you, well, yeah, you, you potentially could. So yeah, if you've got the uh, the inclination to put new, multiple ideas in, but we'd only be I think we you could put multiple in, but we'd only be able to support one. Yeah, I think we have discussed that before. We, All we, right, thank you. We, <laughs> we certainly we would have fund, fund lots of different ideas from the same organisation, but if you want to try and have lots of bites of the cherry, you could. Um, okay, so we have got a couple more um, more questions that have just come in. Um, Freya Atkin Turf says her area of focus is a place, Chinatown in London, that does not have substantial residential community but has distinct communities that travel to the area. This is locally rooted, but not about residents. Would have a, would their version of locally rooted be eligible? Yeah, it doesn't have to be residents. This is about just of a place. So, like you know, you might have people coming into that place, but you can demonstrate that those people are able to influence the organization and the work that you do and you've got that you've got that broad community that broad impact then yeah i can't see that being a problem great okay um and a nice question here from drew um who says he thinks this looks like a fantastic fund thank you very much drew um and he likes the due diligence and non-biased process and unfortunately it's a bit late in the day for the for the process that he's going through he's done his discovery so um he wants to know what the best way for his organization to keep up to date with whether funding becomes available later on for development stage um and would he be available eligible for any later funding if he's done his discovery work outside of this fund oh, that's, that's that's good to hear from you that uh, yeah, that, that uh, it sounds valuable what we're doing here for others but uh, i think um so it's very hard to say at this stage what the um, what would what the future could be, but we are like as power to change and power to trouble. We we want to be that like the catalyst for this field. So like you know we want to start the process of being in here first, and we want to bring a lot of other funders in behind us. So not knowing exactly what that funding will look like, but I think taking on board what Drew's saying here that we we want to make it as broad as possible so not like de defining that we'd have to just like take a very select few through to the next stage so i would keep it open and say that i can't we can't definitely say what that would look like but i think we would take a, uh, a more broad uh, approach so looking to include others who might be at that sort of stage of of then of having an idea so not like and then being able to a community tech idea so um yeah i would it's hard to say but yeah i would i think um taking a broad approach would be what we'd look to do okay great okay so we are very nearly on time and rosanna is, is cracking the whip which i think is fair enough um, <laughs> so i think if we have any other questions then we will respond directly to you if you um let us know 
your um your you know where you're from will be able to get your contact details and respond yeah. directly so thank you Rosanna Thank you, Fergus. Thank you, Rosie. Um, so yes, that is all we have time for. And um, we're really grateful for you to coming along to this session. And if you are watching the recording, thanks for taking the time to do so. Um, I would say you can sign up to the Community Tech um, mailing list on communitytech.network and any future opportunities will be posted definitely through that mailing list. So do take a moment to sign up on communitytech.network. Um, I also wanted to take just a, a moment to make a, a big warm invitation to all of you to come to our very first Community Tech Community of Practice monthly online meetup, which is happening next Tuesday, um, 2 till 3 p.m. online, and will be a beautiful opportunity to meet others who are working in or curious about the future of community tech so we would love to see you there um rosie if you don't mind popping an event bright link in the chat for that that would be great um and if you can't make that session next tuesday there's another one happening on the 13th of july um we will post a video of this webinar on the discovery page of the power to change website by next week so you can refer back to it we'll also post some of the links and things that have been shared and just finally a quick reminder um to get in touch with the power to change community tech team at any point with any questions if you have them in the future the email is communitytech at powertochange.org.uk so thank you very much for coming along today and we hope you have a great rest of your day good luck with your applications